problem. Here's how we're going to punish these people, but not about this is the problem. How do we stop this from becoming a problem? How do we well, educate? How do we, because that's the hard work, right? It's the absolutely. paradigm shift. That's the paradigm shift. Absolutely. So let's go there. I mean, the reality is systems of oppression exist because they benefit those who are in the dominant group. And nobody wants to and has never conceded power without over being overthrown. And this becomes the issue for me. If we're oppressed people talking about hashtag oppressed people problems and have no power, if you will, to remove the people who have placed this oppression in place. What is our course of action? So I don't think that we don't have power. I don't I don't I don't think that we don't have power. I think our power um, is oftentimes limited by our imagination. I think our power is oftentimes uh, limited by our own knowledge and information. I think our power is oftentimes limited by the practical repercussions of trying to live in a capitalist society. But I don't think that we're without power. Um, I'm going to disagree with that. And I'll give you this very specific example. 800,000 Americans were furloughed or went without pay over a fight about a wall. And at no point in time did any of the people in power have any understanding of what that meant to people who were making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year trying to take care of their families. Like, but it, no, but the, I, it that's what I rhetoric. mean. Like, no, that's what I mean when I say we are limited by our our um, ties to a capitalistic society. Meaning, we have to work to eat. Ninety whatever percent of Americans have to work every day to eat. No matter how much education you have, most of us are hustling from paycheck to paycheck. That becomes very, to me, that's very real and practical. The energy that I have at the end of the day, even with my status, even with my class privilege, the energy I have at the end of the day, after taking care of myself, my daughter, tra commuting, being at work all day, being emotionally present for her, keeping the house from falling down and falling apart. Um, I don't have a lot of energy for organizing, for imagining, for dreaming. I don't. I try to make time for that and I try to think about that because that's a particular value of mine. But I also recognize that that's not the case for everybody, that I'm even privileged in that that knowledge. So I, I don't, I, I don't, I guess what I'm pushing back on is your piece is that what I hear, what I worry folks may hear you saying is either we overthrow the system or we it means we're completely without power and agency and i don't believe in that i'm not I i'm not that. no i don't think we need to overthrow the system i think we need to overthrow the concept that we are an active part of the system the system works for us and f just get rid of the concept that um this okay so let me step back i'll say it like this there is this as you know, Democrat versus Republican, conservative versus liberal narrative that has is at this point just nauseating to me and how easily people buy into this narrative. And I sit back and I look at all of this. I look at people's voting records. I look at bills that are introduced, legislation. And so I start asking simple questions. If you were that invested in the American worker as a congressperson, right? Why isn't there a law on the books that says when the government shuts down, Congress people do not get paid, get their benefits or the benefit of government assistance? Why? Because in order for that to happen, Congress would have to put that in place. But I don't assume that they are concerned about the average working person. No. Well, but that's the thing. I assume but, they're concerned but, about the vote. But there are right. 
And that's the point. But what I'm saying is there are people who will listen to rhetoric from people, be they politicians, be they pundits, be they whomever. They will listen to this rhetoric and take it as their own ideology and act on it, which leads to these places of violence, which leads to social media vitriol, which leads to all of this hatred and divisiveness. Meanwhile, to these people, they aren't even practicing what they're talking about because they're protected. They're in a a, a position of power and with that power comes protection so when i'm talking about dismantling uh systems i'm not saying go run down to the uh, um the capital and burn it down no i'm saying understand what the people in power do and what they're all about and demand actual change not punitive change not penalization demand actual change it can happen yeah and that, so that's but that's the part that i wasn't hearing what you were saying that there are people who work who can, community organizers and lobbyists and folks that work on the local level all the time that do that work and, and, and do uh, it very absolutely, well and do it very well and a lot of times they have to go outside of established systems in order to get it done and they have to make it happen that way because they don't get the support of the of the broader community even though it benefits the broader community so mm-hmm. yes kudos to them absolutely so what was your point <laughs> <laughs> my point to you is we spend so much time in the present and the future and we're not dealing with the past and how we rectify that in order to move forward this is what i so, say so here so this is for me okay and i absolutely agree with you on that for me it comes down to a very very simple a very simple equation and it may be oversimplified but this is how i think about it Oppression is a system. There's a group of folks that own the power and have privilege and a group of folks that are less, that have relatively less power and are disadvantaged. And the system operates to keep it functioning on that level. It it works hard to find status quo constantly. That's why we've had racism for 400 plus years, but what it looks like and how it functions has changed over that time because the system continues to find a way to recalibrate itself. The other part about that is we've gotten to a place where we, when we speak about oppression because of laws, because of civil rights legislation, because of rhetoric around egalitarianism, Because of rhetoric around equity, it has almost become synonymous that calling someone a racist or homophobe um, or anti-Semite is like denigrating their character. It's a direct insult to them. And nobody wants to be insulted directly. And what it does is it disempowers us to think about dismantling systems that folks can be engaged in supporting systems, even if their everyday beliefs and actions don't align with those those systems. Until we can come to a collective conversation and recognizing that America and all of its systems, and the very foundation of it is rooted in a system of race and class privilege, we can't begin to undo it. And as long as people keep getting their feelings hurt and feel like their personal character is attacked the moment someone says something about racism, that keeps the conversation from moving forward. Every two minutes, an American is sexually assaulted. Be the someone who gives their time. Be the someone who lends an ear. Be the someone who takes a step. This is Christina Ricci with Rain, asking you to join the fight against sexual violence and volunteer in your community. Log on to Rain.org. That's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G to learn how you can be the someone. This message brought to you by the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network and this station. Thanks for listening. Join us tomorrow for the conclusion of our episode.